here in Baudin, we're investigating a network of mysterious prehistoric caverns and passages known as a Cornish Fugu, dating back to about 400 BC. It's every archaeologist's dream to find a tunnel, and it looks like we've got a void or something there. Now, I don't want to make any assumptions, but we are next to the Fugu, aren't we? We're also looking for signs of an Iron Age settlement. If we are on the level, they do look like possible post holes. We're using brand new state-of-the-art technology to get us into places we couldn't previously go and to build a 3D model of a Fugu. I think it's the first it's been used in the UK. Yeah, something pretty special. And we've got some intriguing finds. How amazing. We've got some glorious weather to greet us at the beginning of day two. And where day one was Fugus, today has already begun to reveal something different, possibly something Roman. And it's not just any old Roman story we're hoping to discover. The experts believe this square feature might just be an enclosure ditch around a Roman temple, which could be hugely important a unique discovery in Cornwall. It's very unusual. We're not used to seeing these very square enclosures in Cornwall. Yeah. Uh, if it's a really big square enclosure, you might say, oh, that's a Roman fort or something like that. But we don't get those down here, really, either. The ditch is beginning to emerge. Yeah, that looks much nicer through here. It does, yeah, it's much stronger much more, colour. Much more like yeah, a ditch. Yeah, it does. But it could be the two large pits that actually hold the crucial evidence. What might that be? Come on, give me some OK, well, they clues. Uh, <laughs> ambiguously, we just say these, these look like pits. But okay. pits can be used for all sorts of okay, reasons. That, that's, that's you could put way. rubbish in pits. Oh, wow. Okay. You could put uh, bodies in pits. OK, I like that. Or you could plant some huge, great totemic pole or something oh, I like that very much. <laughs> <laughs> Pete's already hard at it in Trench 2. Hi, Pete. Yay. Hey. You got to work early this morning. Where he's looking for an Iron Age roundhouse. And he's found a ditch and what could be a boundary or fence line. Oh, that's fantastic, isn't it? They're really Ooh. good, solid, dark brown splodges. We're still hunting for the roundhouse, but the finds have produced a piece of pottery dating from the first century BC to the first century AD. This is such a perfect shirt, isn't it? I mean, you can always draw the whole pot from it. Carl identifies this as part of a cooking vessel that would have been used in the later Iron Age. Damnoni tribes inhabited Devon and Cornwall during this period and remained in control throughout the first Roman invasion by Caesar in 54 BC and Claudius's incursion a hundred years later. When he arrives, um, he invades in 43 with elephants, which always makes me really happy. Do it in style. Yeah, I mean, because you, you assume that the people who lived here were like, that's exactly. the biggest thing we've ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> Up to this point, the biggest thing we'd ever seen was a goat. How's this happen? It's probably a horse. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, when the Romans get here, they spread across, you know, in all different sort of directions. They make, they have incredible incursions into Wales. They make it up, obviously, to Hadrian's Wall eventually uh, is built the, the following century. But Cornwall is a, it's a long way to get across. <laughs> Um, and yet, you know, they, they knew it was worth coming here because Cornwall had this reputation for um, being a, a source of tin. Well, yeah. It's incredibly valuable, of course, incredibly useful. It's probably fair to say that the reason they can get so many tribal leaders to conspire with them, collaborate with them, is because your standard of living probably goes up a bit. You know, so it, you've lived in pre-industrial Britain, here's what you've eaten forever, turnips. I mean, it's... <laughs> and then the Romans appear with olive oil. Oh. And you'd be like, oh, hang on, wait, I can fry this? Are you sure? It's not in pig lard? <laughs> Are you confident of that? Cornwall was exposed to other cultures from prehistory because of the international trade in tin and copper. As early as 300 BC, the Greek explorer Pythias sailed around Britain, starting with Cornwall, and reported that the natives were very civilised, perhaps because of their contact with the wider world. 
So I'm, I'm sensing that Britain's actually quite multicultural, counter to everything that one would expect. Absolutely. So there's evidence from um, the later Roman Empire for around the time, so third, fourth century, so around the time of uh, coins that have been found on this site, yes. um, that by that time, roughly one-fifth of people in Britain are long-distance migrants, i.e. not from Europe. The Helford River was important for both tin and copper, going back before the Roman and Iron Age to the Bronze Age. This dagger, which the Manig team found in a roundhouse at Bowden, dates to around 1300 BC. It's an example of how Cornish tin and copper found on the lizard were combined to create bronze, a new, stronger, harder metal alloy. John spotted something on the geophys that could be a second roundhouse next to the one where the dagger was found, and Matt is opening up a new trench to investigate whether it too is Bronze Age. What do you reckon? That, but, do you reckon that looks like hot? Before I, before I touch it. It's hot. Oh, yeah. Oh, it pops, finally. <laughs> By mid-morning on day two, we had four trenches on the go, looking for features from Bronze Age to Roman. And now James and Stuart want to open up yet another over a well which Chris has found, packed with finds from Neolithic to Roman. Some nice bits of pottery, a pot lug, you know, nice, nice bits of pottery. Wow. And John's brought out his new toy to confirm its location. Just now we're starting to see some really strong reflections. Oh, yeah. Um, and that, I believe, is your well, ritual shaft, or whatever. And now so we're past it. Have we got an idea of total depth there? Well, the top is at about 0.8 metres. Yep. The bottom, I haven't got a clue. OK. <laughs> That's for you to find out. <laughs> and I wish you luck getting down to Australia. <laughs> If this is a ritual shaft, the objects found inside could tell us something about the significance of this site. Bridge, where are you there? Oh, look at you! Helen's in the Mickmobile on a call with the Time Team's conservator, Bridget, who's in New Zealand. The, the first thing that popped into our heads when we, when we saw this yesterday was, oh God, we need Bridge. She wants advice as to how best to prepare the possible coin for examination with the XRF machine, which we hope will help us to identify and to date it. Yeah, so if you've got some deionized water, or actually Evian is what I used to use in the field, it had a, a pretty good um, chemical <laughs> uh, formula on the side of the bottle. And okay. if you put a 50-50 mix with acetone. Oh, okay, right. And then you very carefully swab the, the area that you just want to put that XRF onto is the best thing to do with it. I probably wouldn't recommend at the moment, you know, doing the whole lot. If you're wanting to use it just for the purpose of the XRF, mm -hmm. just using a little bit of cotton wool on the toothpick and just doing a little light swab. And the reason that you're adding the acetone is it speeds up the evaporation rate of the water. I see. I wish everything we were looking for was marked by, yeah. by an iron pen and some concrete to get yeah. us going. Yeah. We're, we're looking for the axe. <laughs> John's radar has meant Stuart and James have already rediscovered Chris's well and are now lifting the lid to see what lies beneath. If the well contains offerings to the gods, it could tell us more about how people lived here and what was important to them. So far, we've been a bit short of finds, but Matt's beginning to sense his luck change in Trench Nine, where he's found a piece of local pottery with a particular significance to the site. So this is it. Look at that. That's a huge thing as well. Yeah, it's chunky, isn't it? And you can see from the side, just this sort of rough texture in the clay. That's it. 
is used to make the pottery in the Iron Age and the Romano-British period, and it's a type of material, so it's this clay with lots of inclusions, little kind of gritty bits in it. Yeah. Uh, the general <laughs> feeling is it's Iron Age, so, you know, it's a bit too late for yeah. us, but uh, it, I think we're on the right track. There's stuff coming up, and we're just starting to get what could be the edge there, so, yeah, it's looking good. And I'm just looking forward to seeing what else you might be able to pull out. I mean, are there other things that have come out? We're getting a few of these pebbles. These wouldn't be found uh, you know, within this field naturally. Yes. So these have definitely been brought in here by somebody, probably as a part of the clay process. How amazing. So it's all, it's all here, Gus. It's just, all here. We just haven't really but it, got to put it, it together. It's trying to make sense of it. <laughs> Come back this afternoon, Gus. I'll, I'll, have a, I'll have a Bronze Age roundhouse for you. OK, <laughs> I'm going to hold you to that, Matt. Chris has gone some way down the well. It's gone down. It's hidden in another stone at the bottom, so... Three foot, I guess. Yeah, Sorry. Meter. And it's beginning to look like it might hold some ritual significance. What about this, James? Oh, OK. Interesting. <laughs> well, that is more interesting. I'm pretty sure that's a, a quern fragment, Indeed. which fits with all those little bits we had there before. Yeah. And this uh, querns are used for, for grinding cereal, yeah, aren't yeah. they? Yeah, you know, grinding wheat. So, um, not, I mean, it is a smallish fragment, of course, but it's an interesting yeah, granite. Flat sides there, yeah, very yeah. flat sides. Pretty, well, you know, warm, you can feel how all the crystals rounded off and everything. Yeah. It's lovely. Breaking a quern or something like that could could be yeah. the sort of thing somebody might do in the past, mightn't it? Oh, yeah. I would just go and bury my head in my hands. And <laughs> <laughs> say, oh, woe is me. <laughs> well, it's interesting all the stuff that you told me that come out, like the axe. It has come out the ground. Do we know they're ceremonial? Gra yeah. Granite. Yeah. yeah. Um, they, they seem like materials yeah. that might have that context. Well, even the pottery, you know, with that connection of gabroic clay with the, you know, the local area here, you yeah. know, all of it really, yeah. so mm. connected to the ground. Interesting stuff, isn't it? So could it be that grain production was important to the story of Boden during the Roman period? Helen's hoping that she too can add to this story if she can prove that this is a Roman coin by scanning it with the XRF machine. Shall we have a look? If you think that's dry Yeah, enough, we can give it a go. I'll just pop it into your hand yeah. so you don't... There yeah. So the wonderful thing about the portable XRF is it's got an inbuilt camera, so we can so make sure we're on the nice clean bit. And we can line it up with the bit you've just cleaned. Um, and what it will do, it'll fire an X-ray stream into the artefact, which is why we'll close this lid. Nice That's the equivalent of leaving the room at the dentist. Yeah, yeah. Yes. So we're, we're safe now. This right. is behind a, a protective shield. So it'll fire an X-ray stream at the artefact and it'll energise it at an atomic level, which then fires out characteristic rays, which allow you to look at the, the individual elements within the artefact. So if we press start, we'll see the data coming in immediately. So. We've got a little bit of iron, but that's probably from the soil yeah. and the muck. Really yes, useful. I can I can spot something immediately. So we've got go uh, there we go. Copper is obviously yes. the, the biggest element yes. in there, which is yes. to be expected with with the corrosion. Uh, a little bit of iron, as I've said, but the other, the that. secondary element, is zinc. That is just brilliant. I'm really pleased. The XRF machine has confirmed that the object is made of the same brass used in Roman coins, which means that Helen can now go to a coin specialist to find out more. Gosh, what a fantastic thing. I really, really want one. <laughs> the coin came from near Trench 2, where we've now found the ditch around what could be a late Iron Age roundhouse. So the inside of the roundhouse, the surface looks a lot different to the outside natural, so do you think that could be a floor surface? Yeah, it could be. It's nice rounded stone, uh, perhaps at a beaten earth floor or something on it. That would be really exciting. Yeah. And that has a sort of lip like that. Yeah, I can see that. I'm trying to see if I can make out a design on the coin to see if I can try to help to identify it. Now, when you lift it up, the beauty of, as you say, Helen, being able to handle it, is that you can see a slight sort of shadow that is curving round in that direction. 
The Menid team have been hard at work in Trench 4, where we've found the square enclosure ditch, which we think surrounded a Roman temple, and we're on the hunt for two large pits, which might contain valuable clues. Carl! <laughs> Roman to me. No. It's no. prehistoric, my guess. It, it's quite crude, heavily abraded. Oh, I think this is Bronze Age. Ooh, Bronze Age. Bronze Age. So that, I mean, it's right at the top of this feature. So if that, that as a square feature with pits like this in the Bronze Age, that's, that's not completely right. Completely unheard of. Yes. <laughs> it might not support the Roman temple theory, but pottery like this has been found all over the site and dates from around 1300 BC. I mean, some of these are so beautiful. Yes. This is um, imprinted cord, but this sort of pottery is, and it's quite rare in archaeology that you can almost get close to an individual. Hmm. Can you see that there? You've got fingernail decoration, where they've impressed their fingernails. Of course, these are objects of utility, but it's also that they were making things that are absolutely beautiful. I mean, that these marks across the surface, that they are obviously about art as well it, as about... It, it's uh, certainly visual and has been speculated that some of the very patterns may represent individual families as well. Because some of these things are huge, aren't, aren't they, Carl? Yeah, well, so something like this... This um, comes from roughly the same sort of size vessel as the one drawn here. Which is what which, uh, which I've reconstructed um, conservatively. It comes up to my waist. So the... Mouth is there, and it would have been about that wide. Gabroic clay was used in local pottery from the Bronze Age throughout the Roman period. The reason lies in its special properties, which meant that it was less likely to crack in firing. We've dug some from a local source, and we've invited experimental archaeologist and potter Angie Wickenden to demonstrate some of the techniques that Bronze Age potters might have used. This is what we call short. It's got a lot of... Um, short like pastry, like Short it, like pastry. It crack. It's cracking up. It's really difficult making pots with gabbro at this stage. Fresh gabbro clay is difficult to work. So Angie believes that prehistoric potters would have stored it in the ground for months to increase its plasticity. That's much better, isn't it? Yeah, much softer and the grit is much Tinier, yeah, yeah. So it doesn't have the sort of chunks in it at all. Is it easier to make it really? Yeah, much look, thinner you've done it. You've done it. Compared you with that one. Yeah, yeah. You see how so that's I can different. Press it to a much thinner texture. The pots would have been built up from bases by coiling the clay. You're going to put the coil on the inside there, yep. and you're going to smooth it down to attach it with your thumb. Okay. And then you're going to put it up on top and smooth it down on the inside, yep. like that. Then pebbles, like the ones from Matt's trench, were used to smooth the inside. I've got a pebble, now use the round bit and smooth that on the inside. Oh, it's working. Angie's experimented with many different tools and thinks that the decoration on pottery here would have been made using twisted wool or perhaps nettles. Yep. And you just split the nettle open, take out the pith, and there's fibres inside. And you make the cordage by just twisting it like yep. this. And so you end up with this. And you end up with this string. Yep. And you kind of get, get the best part of the string, not where it's unravelling, and you lay it on the clay, and with your fingertips, you press it in right. like that and push it in to the clay with your fingernails. I wonder whether they pushed it in with the bone tools as well. They did lots of chevrons, created these patterns in, on the pots. So that's really good. You Thanks. see, you're such a confident potter, Bronze Age potter. Yes, I am. And I'm um, getting a T-shirt that says that. <laughs> Given how time-consuming the process is, Angie thinks that the huge Bronze Age pots found on this site would have been made by more than one person. Carenza's putting in Trench 5 on the highest point in Victor's Field over a curvilinear feature that could be an enclosed settlement from the Iron Age or Romano-British period, known as a Cornish Round. Well, that's looking like a bit of burnt stone there, and that's definitely 
inspired clay of some sort there. I'm not sure if that's a bit pottery or whether it's a bit of daub from the wall of a, a, a building or something. Just next door, Stuart and Henry have climbed above the tree line to see what the land would have looked like during the Iron Age when the fugu was in use. This hilltop was clearly a place strategically important for trade routes going out to sea, but also spiritually, as it's surrounded by Bronze Age barrows visible on the horizon. So, was the fugu here because of the trade routes, or because of the ritual significance of the site, or both. A better picture of the cavern that Chris found originally and how it was accessed might help us answer this question. But what we want to do is see whether this void, which opened up um, initially and was originally covered with the metal plate, whether there's any connection between that void and this ditch coming through here. So my radar trace has come across this line. We can see the ditch, as I said, and these weaker responses, but still pretty clear, suggest that the void does continue through um, at a similar depth, and it looks as though it may well join with that. If John's right, the void was accessible from both the outer enclosure ditch and the Fugu stone line passageway and might have been a huge cavern similar to Khan Uni. But the data from Lawrence's scans are suggesting something different. So we can see the entrance to the tunnel just here. These are the timber frames just holding and propping it up. If we spin it round into side view, you can see that tunnel is lower than the ground surface with these white dots along the top here. But more interestingly, it's coming off parallel with the, uh, the, the main hallway channel to the Fugu itself. So whilst Don John's picking up features that are potentially running this way, the, uh, the 3D data suggests it might be running this way. So there's a bit of contrast and conflict around what it is that we're actually seeing. So what, why would it come back on, go back on itself? We're hoping more detailed scanning will help us work out whether the cavern becomes bigger or turns into a passageway. So therefore, if it's, if, if the stones go... We stuck your scanner down there. Uh, we, we haven't, but we, we can and we will fill yeah. it in. Things are a little clearer in Trench 1, where we've found the enclosure ditch and a passageway to the cavern at the other end of the Fugu. We're now trying to work out if they connect. Abby, found two stones here. They're not joined. Um, yeah, if we, OK, if we just clean round them. Lovely. Right, so the fugu is over there. Yes. And I was there yesterday with James, and we were hoping that that very deep, alarming passage that he really <laughs> clambered down into, and I watched him, um, would curve round and meet us here. And it sort of looks like it has. Yes. So Ryan's in the first slot. We put a slot across what we think is the side passage and it's looking very likely. And the trench next to Ryan, what's happening there? That is a slot looking at the relationship between the side passage and the enclosure ditch, seeing if they were contemporary, if they met up, if they blocked the end of the passage with stone. So what happens next, Abby? It looks like, is it, are you just making Ryan do all the digging on his own? It's, at the moment, it's looking like a very solo endeavour. <laughs> It's group work, is it, archaeology? Doesn't look like it from Ryan's perspective. That's all I'm saying. I'll give you a hand later. All right, then. <laughs> to help us get a sense of what these tunnels might have looked like, Lawrence has been looking for the stones that might have formed part of the corbelled ceiling. Maybe you can reconstruct them and, and put the exact stones in a, in a place where they may have been. Well, I think it'd be lovely to do that, wouldn't it? I think if we can actually lift them from where they've landed and move them to a close spot, um, and you reuse them, even if it's only virtually, I think there's, there's a virtue in Yeah, that. absolutely. Using the fugu at Khan Uni for reference, Ray San will try to restore the huge stones to their rightful positions. So I'm still trying to get my head around the idea of you've got these big, heavy stones, and I assume they've got earth above them as well, a level of it. So is that 
Are we seeing when you're on the ground a pronounced lump above the features, or is it actually a, the, the ground level is even across above them? That capping stone we were looking at is just at the end of the the uh, the area here. I don't know if you can see that in, on, with my mouse. Yep. And then so this is yeah, the, the floor surface. We've got um, the coursing of the uh, the stones to 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 make the passageway. Um, and then this is the, the foot or two of, of earth that I mentioned that's found above it. it uh, this, this is deeper than I am at all. And it is, as you say, it's a crouched down, yep. huddling experience. It would have been very dark. Um, it would have been quite claustrophobic with the capping stones on the top, I think. Graysand's reconstruction will also have to make sense of the different building techniques used below ground. Above ground in Trench 2, there's a dispute about whether we're looking at an Iron Age roundhouse or a Bronze Age barrow. We've got a ring feature in the magnetics that's as clear as daylight, about eight or nine metres wide in diameter. That's what we've got in the trench. And that makes it a what? Well, I think it's a ring ditch that isn't to do with habitation. It's probably... Uh, a barrow, a burial. James, do you agree with well, that? Well, I'm not convinced. Not con um, <laughs> I, that kind of diameter, I was expecting it to be a roundhouse, maybe late Iron Age, Romano British roundhouse. Um, and I'm still of that opinion, I think. Are you feeling that this is a ditch that has been dug or a ditch that has been uh, um, worn away or both? It, when we talk about an eaves strip, is it a yeah, deliberately no, dug no. drainage? It's a deliberately dug drainage or enclosure, mm -hmm. in fact. So perhaps yeah. it's acting as both. It's not necessarily just taking the water from the roof. Right. But also to provide some quarry material, which might have created a bit of a low wall inside, uh, inside the, uh, the ditch for a building. But where's the central half? Where's the pottery? This is the other side of it here, isn't it? Yeah, something, something like, like that. That's quite a sort of domestic sort of size, yeah, isn't it? Yeah. Bronze Age barrows tend to be fairly large, but they can be an immense variety of sizes, can't they, James? They can, but around here, I wouldn't expect them to be this small. So uh, I'm beginning to feel that this is getting to be the kind of argument that can only be solved in one way, and that is not by pistols at dawn and not oh, no. by the evidence of oh, this. Dear. It's by digging the rest of it. OK. If we can find the centre of the ring ditch, we just might find a hearth or a burial to tell us whether we've got an Iron Age roundhouse or a Bronze Age barrow. The sun's going down on day two, and I'm hoping Matt has lived up to his promises in Trench 9. We started this trench looking for a Bronze Age roundhouse, and I did promise you, Gus, didn't have I? you found my roundhouse? <laughs> <laughs> we have found this amazing burnt soft silt layer there going round. We've got an arc of it going round here, going round here, going round here. And I reckon that's the edge of our roundhouse. Oh my. And look, best of all, we have a post hole, that circle there, which would be along the edge of the roundhouse. So yeah, I reckon I've fulfilled my promise to you. How thrilling you have. I mean, that is thrilling. And so for tomorrow, what, what's the plan then? Well, what do you think? You can see how, uh, how the, the silt is kind of sloping downwards. I think the, 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 the fills of the roundhouse have sunk down inwards, so we're getting deeper and deeper. All this stuff that you're standing on, probably about a foot needs to come out. So yeah, it's gonna be a hard, hard morning tomorrow. Looking at these fills here, this is almost identical to the roundhouse we had just over there. Wow. These kind of, you know, these burnt spreads with the charcoal in and the burnt clay, uh, really, really similar. So yeah, it's really promising. I think on the one over there, there was pottery laid down in the middle. Wow. So I reckon that's probably about maybe 30 centimetres below your feet. Probably all down there. <laughs> we, had, we had 600 odd finds from the roundhouse there. So who knows what we're going to find under this? Who knows indeed. Just one day left. We've got to get to grips with a Bronze Age landscape, the mystery of an Iron Age fugu and the ring ditch in Trench 2. Not to mention the question of whether Boden was once the site of a unique Roman temple. It's a tall order.
for exclusive insights, 3D models, Q&As and polls, please join Time Team on Patreon.